All right, so welcome to NOPG. Today we have a very special guest. How I approach YouTube at the start is not as a financial advisor, actually. When I go into my YouTube space, I'm a YouTuber. So we have Josh Tan, the founder of The Astute Parent. You might have seen his content on YouTube because he delivers a lot of great content talking about retirement planning, tax planning, insurance, comparison of different equity stocks, portfolio planning. So you're in for a treat today. Let's go. Do you do um, content every day now? It's infused to the workflow. La. So okay. I also use content to find customers okay. in the financial advisory space. Okay. So okay. Uh, in a week, I have certain targets on what I want to complete. La. Okay. And as, as I said, I'm more of one man show, mm. which means you know, I need to push things to, to completion mm. so that I can keep that consistency there. Okay. You, you started um, your YouTube channel in 2015. So it's been about nine years already. How has that journey been like in terms of like uh, giving free education online? I think the initial motivation was to find customer. Okay. I think that that, that should always be put forefront right. because we always need to settle the Im immediate goals then we can think longer term. Right. While thinking longer term is important, uh, there's a step-by-step -step process. Mm. So that was my first goal, how to reach that first customer. Right. Then when that first customer is achieved already, hey, how to reach the first 100 customer. Mm. And then that's where we try to scale and think how to do it more consistently, how to build the brand even bigger. Right. So at the very start, uh, I had all sorts of self-doubt. Okay. Because there's no proven model. Ma. All right, things are very early. Mm. So that's good and that's bad. So when things are early, uh, there's no competition. But then I guess you, you've seen the journey yourself also. Mm. Uh, then there's no blueprint also. Yeah. So yeah. finding a customer is about overcoming that, you know, that self-doubt that right. it can it be done. So once it's done that, hey, I have something to prove mm. that I can, I can double down on the branding. I can double down on reaching the market with the same message right? because I know it works. Furthermore, uh, I think you are like the, the one of the very early content creators back in 2015 and uh, you are largely like focusing on the financial space. I saw that you graduated with accountancy, yes. uh, NTU, and then uh, you went to intern at a research firm Subsequently, uh, you went to like full on financial planning space, right? The journey into financial planning has it been like twenty years? Oh, almost le. Almost, almost twenty years. Almost twenty years. Okay. Of course, I start off as a undergrad. Mm. So back then, of course, undergrad there's less pressure, right? Uh, you do sales, you get sales, not too bad. There's no bills that you need to pay mm. as an undergrad. Uh, but I think that success gave me confidence that I don't need to follow mainstream, cause ninety five percent of my classmates went to big four audit firm. Right. Maybe 4% of the remainder went to, went to banks. Right. So I'm that 1% who went directly into sales. Okay. And, and you chose the uh, self-employed route. Yeah. So without some initial success, I, I think that'll be a mental block. Mm. But with that, I've seen success. I think, hey, maybe it fits me. Right. And, and, I, and as you go through this journey uh, into the financial planning space, what makes you want to persevere in this space? Like, um, as you go along, as you give out more and more advice, you meet more and more, you help more and more customers. Uh, what is that one ingredient that keeps you so passionate about this, this space? I think the journey, whenever we do any service business, we we'll start off with one market segment. We master it, we, we find that gratification. Then we'll realize, hey, what is that a different boundary? There's mm. always a next leg. Like, you know, in property space, I guess it's the HDB, then you go to the condo and the landed space. Yeah. So in advisory space also, there's different market segments and there's always new things to learn. But I guess the deepest core must be in the passion. Mm. I, I, I just love financial numbers, investments, uh, investment products. These are things that I genuinely research even day-to-day -day basis when I create content now. Right. So discovering a new frontier always brings the excitement again. It's up to us to mm. keep that in mm. terms of mastery. I think any top chef will also look at their journey the same way. At the start, they only know how to make a few dishes. Then how to create more and more cuisines and eventually, you know, uh, create mastery in their craft. Right. So that is a discovery process. Right. And um, one of the trainings that we, we teach our consultants is we, we call it the niche positioning, mm. which is to start with a niche first. So for example, let's say if a consultant, they want to focus or they have a passion on landed homes, we will challenge them to really focus to be like a very deep expert on, on landed properties 
even going into like uh, building materials, architecture and all that to value at your clients. And I've seen like in terms of your content, like how you grew. It's like now when I look at your content, there's like um, advice on retirement planning. You also talk a little bit about property. Uh, you also talk about analysis of stocks. Then you also have case studies on like um, maybe like inheritance plus like uh, perhaps like a comparison on some financial products and all that. So what was your first like niche uh, so-called like focus when you oh. started back then? Oh, maybe could I pivot the question back to sure. ask a bit more because I'm super curious uh, when you mentioned about new consultants. So yeah. do you actually suggest their niche or like, or, or do they all start with like HDB first then progress to land it all? Right. So um, in PRB, we focus, I would say like 80% on private condos uh, as well as landed homes. So uh, when any new consultants come in, they have to go through the entire syllabus. Lah. It's like a three months. We have okay. a, like an internship training uh, where weekends they have to tag with senior consultants. Then they have to learn like timeline, financial planning, marketing of homes, how to present and all that kind of stuff. Then different knowledge of different types of homes like HGB properties for condos, landed as well. Then after they they done it for about one to one and a half years, then we'll challenge them like, which sphere do you want to specialize? Yeah. Okay. So we, we use like a university concept first. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we challenge them to, to specialize. Wow. Yeah. I think that's something I need to keep in mind. How to, how to, how to train someone or some, some of your consultants as well. Correct, right, correct. right. I believe you have a team also. Yes, a very small one. So okay. I'm always looking for ideas. What is a good concept? Mm. Looking back on my own journey, uh, same thing. My first immediate boss gave me a spectrum of products, but it's usually the retail side. Right. So I have to go there and market road shows, uh, cold call, the standard process. So in my journey, that first few years was grounding process, mm. the bread and butter products. But very soon I realized that that doesn't differentiate mm. my service because as we know, everyone in the advisory space will carry their product. Mm. And sometimes these products have cons that, you know, uh, don't really have a good market reputation for one way or another. So then how do I refine my own craft? That's where I need to push the boundaries. Then that becomes, you know, the boss cannot, cannot show. It, it, it becomes more self-driven mm. in that sense. Mm. So I craft a bit more on what I like to specialize, what I think is good value to customer. Right. And yeah. uh, as I progress more on the internet space, I also realized if I want to brand myself on the internet, I need to go with certain products more and go with certain products less in a nutshell. Mm. Uh, just to make sure that my reputation and my uh, workflow, uh, my end product that I produce to the marketplace is congruent with what I teach mm. uh, on, on social media channels. Right. So would you say like uh, one for one of your early key focus was on retirement planning? What was that? Oh, I think we came a bit later. Okay. So the earlier few products are usually the saving plans. Right. How you should save for education, not $100 per month. I mastered that. How you should do hospital insurance, mm. how, uh, you know, one can plan for family and stuff. But that's the retirement planning part comes a bit later. Right. Only so, like in, in recent years. Only in recent years. Okay. That's where I realized I can tie, tie in all my different uh, learning points across the years right. and differentiate myself in that space. Mm. Then it makes sense. Okay. Uh, at the start, uh, I too, at the start I was 20 plus. So I didn't even believe in retirement planning also. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Maybe let's let's move into like digging digging a bit deeper into your expertise mm. uh, for the benefit of our audiences. So our, we we have a wide range of audiences ranging from um, people who just uh, started work in the in the workspace in their twenties and all the way to retirees as well. So uh, of course our audiences on NLTG they are very focused on real estate as one of the core portfolio. And um, but of course we all believe in like a balanced portfolio. Is is like um, balanced in the sense that we should have like liquid equities uh, at the same time, like for emergency funding and all that kind of stuff. Maybe let's dive uh, dive into like a young person first. Um, we all know that like cost of living is is escalating on a year to year basis, inflation. And of course, like the two most major things like uh, a vehicle plus real estate is escalating every year in Singapore. So um, let's start with maybe somebody in their mid twenties who just came out to the marketplace. What are like some of your advice for them uh, to chart for the next five to 10 years? Mm. Yeah, in terms of like savings investment, also like insurance as well. Actually, yeah. I, to your point just now you mentioned about uh, being balanced, I fully agree on that. Mm. I cover real estate because it's important 
to a person's finances. Mm. More often than not, it's the, their biggest purchase anyway. So if they nail it right, usually half the battle is won. Or if they get into something they they regret, then again, everything else gets stuck. Yeah. So the budget always starts with real estate. Mm. And a lot of times, uh, a family's biggest expense and their liabilities also come from that space. Yeah. So I kind of give a view that uh, covers real estate because I believe it's it's part of the financial uh, uh, part of the equation. So the point of, uh, for someone who is young, maybe retirement question, I've seen experts mention you should start retirement planning as early as possible. Actually, I disagree with that. Because when I look back on my own journey, when I was 25 versus when right now I'm 40, what I want uh, is very different. I, I guess also when you think about it, when you are 25, you're probably just getting married, first kid not even here maybe. Uh, there's a lot of things in life that you are not settled yet, which means retirement planning requires you to commit long-term plans in. You need to have certain variables removed. Mm. Then our planning process got concrete ground. You know, we plan for something and then five years later, you're on a home upgrade. We tear everything down. Mm. Then the whole equation gets out of whack. Mm. What are the variables like? So for example, home. Someone who is 25 may not have bought their first home yet. And even if they bought their first home, yet, it may not be the one they are going to last. Versus someone- my switch. Yeah. Correct. Someone at 40, I kind of know, would I have a second home? Or rather, I'm already in my second home. Would I have a third home? Or what it would look like? Mm. My kid's more or less settled already. So in terms of the grounding part, the variables are removed because of life stage. Having said that, I think the saving process still needs to be there. It doesn't mean 25, we don't plan for retirement. We don't save. It's not true. Uh, it's just that we save for building up long-term goals. It could be for property upgrade. It could be for something else. But we don't define it as, you know, you buy a product just for retirement planning. It's not. It's a bit too early. Mm. But at 40, then these discussions come in. Right. What is your long-term expense? Do you see yourself working in 10 years? Oh, yeah, maybe so. But at 25, start of the career. Like, mm, there's too many variables and moving parts. Exactly. Right. So you don't even know your career development. Your current pay now could triple when you get to a management level. Mm. Which means all you need to do now is just to get your habits right. Save, invest, save, invest. When time is ready, buy a first house. More often than not, that's good advice. Uh, then, then that process will carry you far enough to your next stage in life. Mm. Uh, so that's where I usually differ from some experts who mention on media, oh, you should start planning from 25. Right. May not be. Right. Leave that to a later stage, just focus on the basics. Build up your capital, build up your habits. Then at 40, when we have the discussion, we resonate and we we, we are more ready la, to mm. lead the long-term growth. So 40, you feel that through your journey is about the right age to start talking about it. Yes. Uh, planning for retirement at maybe 50, 55 and, and yes. ranges like, all right. Yes. Um, so do you have like a segregation in terms of like seasons of life? Like mm. like recently I just did uh, a career visionary exercise with my kids. So I have four kids. So three of them are really teenagers. Okay. So I, I, I did like a career visioning in terms of uh, a pie chart uh, with four spectrum. So the first spectrum, I told them that zero to 25 is the time that you will need to build your skills and knowledge in a very rapid phase. Uh, and of course, like, you need to explore as much as you can. 25 to 50 is really like your building stage where you have your family, your career, uh, your home and things like that. Then from 50 to 75, of course, that's the time that you might want to start enjoying a little bit more, uh, do mission work and stuff like that. So like, do you have like a framework when you are usually planning for seasons of life? Well, uh, I have to ask your, your, your kids. For <laughs> so any of them keen on real estate? I mean, they are zero to 25, right? I, yeah. I was so curious. Yeah. Uh, um, do they see my, like- My eight, eldest is, is 18 this year. Yeah, mm. he's JC too. So uh, of course they, they know that their dad does real estate, runs a business. So we usually have conversations like on leadership or pe on people, or a bit on real estate, a bit on like alternative investments. Yeah, oh. we, we have a bit of like, training at home. La. I, okay. I, I, I usually train them to do presentations and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. So, oh, that's, so that's, that's what awesome. we do on a fun basis, but nothing stressful. It's just for fun. So they've not expressed, hey, I want to come into no, no, this no, business. No, no. Too. Yeah. I, I told them that this business is, uh, it will not be handed to you. Mm. Yeah. I said that this is not a family business. We, we are running like a, a business on an entity on its own. Yeah. Oh. Of course, you have to find your own passion. But of course, if they are keen in real estate, I will teach them naturally. Wow. Yeah. I, I always have to ask that because my kids now are nine and four. Right. So in my perspective, I always think I can, I can decide for them. 
but then I'm I'm sure that when they reach teenage, they have their own minds yes, and, yes. and they pursue their own passions differently. Right. So I'm always trying to learn, you know, what, what, what does a teenager think? How much influence as parents can we mm. give to them? Mm. Uh, so back to the point on uh, stages yeah. or, or rather a, a customer goes through that stages in terms of what they need differently. Uh, but to my practice, maybe I would segregate to what I want better. Mm. What is my best fit in terms of the niche? Because uh, someone who is zero to 25, for example, they're f- they building our first pot. Yeah. So I see that segment as I give free advice, can we? I, I write ebooks. Right. What you should do with your money. Mm-hmm. You want to purchase it's $10, 12, $12. Uh, or free content. Or uh, what Uncle Josh has done before when mm-hmm. I was younger, what mm-hmm. I regret, what I don't regret. Right. Uh, so I give free content. Life lessons. Correct. Uh, so I think they benefit more from free content and they are still experimenting. Mm. So maybe to that point, uh, my best market segment could be the 40 to 50 segment. Mm. Uh, so in terms of marketing as a brand, uh, I also kind of realize where's my sweet spot. Mm, like your expertise where's is the, towards correct. these demographics. Correct. So that the client is also aligned. Mm. We save each other time. Right. And I can further the development in, in terms of that knowledge. Right. Which is why your content are largely towards like people with existing portfolio. Yes. 40 to 50. I pre-qualify them. Okay. So I kind of can decide whether they would pay for the service, they would appreciate the service. Mm, mm. Uh, so then that saves me time also. Okay, uh, so. great. I, I think that's very important like when when we talk about um, running a business and at the same time, this is like running your professional expertise business. Mm. And I think if your core group is defined, it's also easier for your customers to find you. Mm. Yeah, which, uh, okay, then let's move to the 40 to 50 mm. segment. <laughs> okay, so uh, maybe let's talk about uh, 40 the age that you recommend to maybe start and talk a little bit about retirement planning. There was an episode that you did on the FIRE movement. Hmm. Yeah, so F-I-R-E. Maybe share with our audience a little bit on like, how should somebody approach retirement at a very initial stage? Like thinking about the model, what should they plan for? um, How do they structure it? Okay, In, in terms of retirement, the equation is actually very simple. It's not about how much financial products we have, how much real estate we have. It's just as simple as, do you have more than enough income or assets to liquidate? There's more than your expenses. Very simple. So if you own real estate, there's no liabilities there. Your net cash flow positive and you don't spend that much. Like your rent income is $10,000. Your expenses are $5,000. You're already financially free. You can retire. You don't need active income. But on the other hand, if your real estate is negative in terms of cash flow, you kind of know you're making up that gap through active income. Mm. Then your equation gets a bit more difficult mm. to quickly answer. Right. So in terms of retirement planning, it's very simple. You have to get that understanding where are your cash flows, maybe your negative cash flow from that asset for the time being. But we map it out. Where would you be in five years? Where would you be in 10 years? So if we can visualize that together from the government schemes like CPF, where are your cash flows? And once you know your cash flows, you kind of know how ready you are for retirement. Mm. Uh, so purchasing the asset to help your retirement also needs to balance that point of view. Can you take on debt, which may cause negative cash flow, uh, or are you satisfied with current assets uh, and how much you can consume from there? Mm. So the whole retirement planning process is about knowing yeah, your exact cash flows when you stop work. Right. If somebody were to start at 40, mm. um, usually is that a formula that will help them to be able to retire within 10 years, for example? Well, uh, they, it depends a lot on their starting point. Mm. Someone at 40 with a million dollars and someone at 40 who is just barely saving, the journey is different. Mm. The readiness is also different. So first example, someone who, who has a million dollars at 40, then the question becomes knowing their own expenses. How far, because a million dollars can last, for example, uh, 5,000 per month quite easily. Yeah, but then if you don't know your ex- what, what you expect in terms of expenses wise, right? Then you can't define whether that million dollars is enough or not. Yeah, right. So that's where there's a difference. Now on the other hand, if someone at 40 is just getting that awareness, oh, I need to start building up my base. I've been money in, money out. Then the coaching part is really how to get started on the right habits. Mm. Unfortunately, the journey ahead is very long. The expectation should not be five, 10 years. We need to draw the yardstick way further mm. because it's a journey ma. when right. you have no money and we have first hundred thousand how you manage it right and then we have a first million 
how you manage your, your thinking process is also a bit different. Mm. Yeah. So I think the first thing that I'll define for that second person is you should change your expectations. Uh, right now we start here, but it's better not starting. Then along the journey, you kind of know it better uh, how fast you can build towards that goal. Right. So um, when somebody comes to you, usually what you do is that you will chart their journey out for them, like mm. in terms of like a timeline basis. Because I, I see some of your case studies, mm. uh, you look at very detailed stuff, like how much is their CPF and all that kind of stuff, their debts. Mm. Um, and also you ask, you, you sort of like quiz them. You like use the word quiz to ask them about <laughs> their um, expenses and all that. Uh. Like is there, um, I, I remember there was an episode that you were sharing that if somebody can save, I think like 4,000 plus or 5,000 per month, then within how many years they can retire or something like that. Is there like, like a formula or something like that? There are formulas mm. that always make uh, the journey quantifiable. Uh, so for example, that four or 5,000. Oh, uh, I mentioned that because in a study, it's found that those who save more than 4,000 plus, they, the majority of them are financially free already. There's a correlation. Mm. You are able to save a lot means you typically have built up something already. You're probably a lot more frugal than most. So being financially free is a consequence of a high savings rate. Right. But also to say four or 5,000, you probably draw a good enough income. Mm. You probably yeah, draw something that can allow you to save that because everybody has fixed expenses. Yeah. Yeah, so to that point, uh, how to create that formula uh, in, in my channels, I try to show case studies and just now you're, you're mentioning about questions. I think a, a good consultant is defined by the questions they ask. How, how deep we can we probe? Because finance is always like that. You, you ask someone something, they don't give you the deepest layer of the reason. Mm. They have a habit, they have a belief, but it comes with their own trauma, their own experiences. It's up to us to question why do you why do you spend it like that? Or why do you believe that this is the right way to do it? Mm. Uh, so in, in my process, I also practice that. It sharpens my advisory work also. Right. Uh, so that's where it uncovers more layers to the right. story itself. So you go with an approach that um, habits actually shape mm. your savings rate. Habits are like one of the core foundation that, that affects a lot of the decision. Um, what are maybe like some good habits that you think is like, lasting is 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 always like timeless mm. that you think somebody should always adhere to if they, they have a, like a retirement mindset in mind. Mm. I th I think in Asia, right, our our culture is a bit more conservative. Asians are known to save a lot more money than Westerners. Uh at the start of my journey I looked a lot of West uh American YouTube channels on finance. Then I realized they talk whole day about debt clearance. Because in America, their savings rates are very different from here in Singapore. Mm. So in terms of their first problem is clearing away debt. Singapore, there are some who are stuck with debt, but it doesn't seem as extreme as what I, what I see from that. So the point of what kind of good habits, I think uh, the Asian culture already reminds us we need to save money. But that good wisdom sometimes is not practiced. Mm. Uh, so that's where uh, over time, the end result of where the person is at, the, at this planning phase reflects whether they've lost a lot of this good advice or not. Mm. Maybe their parents have been very prudent, right. but then they've gotten their paychecks, their environment changes them differently. They become very extravagant. In certain careers, you are like a bit more exposed. Lah. Then you start to money, money out. Then that problem comes in. Mm. Then they realize it's time for a change. Right. In terms of debt clearance, savings, mm -hmm. maybe let's talk a little bit about insurance. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, like there's a, there's a lot of different insurance products like term insurance, critical illness and, and all that. Uh, chat a little bit about like when it comes to the space of insurance, is there any like recommendation on like what kind of insurance do you think somebody, maybe even, even though I know that you specialize in 40 to 55, <laughs> but maybe if somebody is like before 40, like uh, should they start with like term first? then focus on health, then try not to go too much into life and stuff like that. Or like what, what should be like the right balance while they're trying to, to balance this journey? In insurance is a concept that is important. Mm. It's my core starting practice. But on the other hand, I don't have a lot of content on insurance. And it's, and it's because insurance is not commonly searched for. It needs to be sold, that, mm. that idea. But it's a good point to mention also. Uh, so to the point of what is the right framework for insurance. How I approach it is I show what I existingly own. Mm. 
I have certain tutorials on your own portfolio, my own portfolio. Okay. So I transparently show you what I have. Right. I'm covered for $1.5 million because that reflects my liability mortgage mm. and possible expenses. I'm covered for $1.35 million for critical illness because that reflects certain number of years of income mm. or something like that. So I use my own portfolio as a case study, as a case study rather than go with the dry part. Okay, this, this is what the industry recommends as best practice mm. because that has been mentioned, but it, it has no context. Right. So through my own journey, I show you, okay, if you are from a different situation, you're single, then you you may not need death insurance. Mm. It's up to you. Oh, so for example, I've seen cases whereby someone who's earning well, an individual, bought a property for investment. Mm. The usual suggestion is you need death cover to, for that liability. Mm. $1 million uh, loan, you should cover $1 million. Mm. But actually, if you think about it, if that person is single, and that's purely investment property, mm. renting it out, mm. he's still happy staying with parents. Mm. Does that property loan really need to be covered or not? Because mm. if you think about it, if he goes, Who is his, his parents take it and sell it. Mm. There's no impact to day-to-day -day life. Yeah, it's not like you have a spouse, you have kids, and you pass on the liability. Exactly. You worry them. Correct. Right. And we want them to stay in the house. Yeah. Because that's where memory is. Mm. But there's just an asset. There's no feeling. It's just like business. Mm. He goes, the parents sell the house, Done. take back whatever there's there. the loan. And so what is the purpose of that? So typically that, that is something that needs to be talked a, a, a bit deeper. Mm. The purpose of the insurance. Mm. So when I do a case, typically at a starting phase in career, the purpose is harder to define. Zero to 25, yes, the best practice is you should cover this, this, this. I can say to the cows come home. But then if I find that you're, you don't find a purpose to it, maybe it's hard to. Like why are you even buying this? Why are you even <clears> buying <throat> Correct. It's, yeah. it's a bit hard. Yes, good practice is this, but you don't quite believe in it. Mm. Never mind. Because when you come to a different age, you will be living in already. Your needs will arise. Yes, correct. Then it's a lot more fruitful, that conversation. Mm. So when you have kids, ah, then that's very obvious already. The consequence I can define for you. Right. Why you should buy for your kids, I can also define for you. Mm. There are some experts who say, oh, kids don't need uh, insurance beyond medical insurance. I disagree. Mm. I feel that if your kids have critical illness insurance, the purpose is if they are sick, you take the lump sum payout as a parent, and you might take a sabbatical mm. from work. Because if you hear enough case studies, you realize the thinking process is different already. When you hit a trauma, you think career previously, but you suddenly would hack career mm. because your mindset has changed. Mm. But you need that payout to fulfill that change in terms of preference. Mm. So a parent buying critical nurse for kid may have that purpose. And that's why I share on my channel. Right. I buy for my kid because if that event comes upon, I want to have that choice. I stop work. I take the 500,000, let me think about life. I, I be there for six months, no problem. Mm. I buy for my wife, critical illness insurance, very simple. Something happens to her, I take that payout, I might stop. Mm. No regrets. Mm. So that pay, that coverage on her is for me to have no regrets and vice versa. To buy time as well. To buy time. Right. So insurance, I try to link it very closely to your purpose. Mm. If you understand what is the payout for, when you plan everything before a traumatic event hits, then you are more ready. Right. Uh, then we can define exactly how much. If not, it's, it'll be me selling you, you need this figure. Mm. You don't own it. It's, it's a very hard conversation. Right. So should somebody buy life insurance for their kids? That's what I do. Mm. Very simple. Because life insurance is just permanent insurance, which means a kid covers from age zero, ideally for lifelong. So next question is, why should we cover kids for insurance? Uh, very simple. Because for kids, as I mentioned, anything happens to them, you want to pay out. But if not, if something happens to them that is not very serious or so, you realize that they may not be able to buy something along the years. Could we as parents buy something as a first layer for kid? As a gift. As a gift. So the trick becomes, can you prepay that gift and give them as an asset? Mm. Then you pass it on and they have no idea on what it is for. Mm. So what I share is, I buy something then the trip comes, you don't need to buy too much, you realize. You're just buying as a standby. Standby means you don't need to buy a million dollars. Right? Mm. What's the purpose of it? That, that is no longer standby. So it's a small amount that you define and own it yourself. And the goal is to pay it off and give it to them. If they have any trauma, luckily I bought something for you. Mm. If they don't have, that's where the term insurance comes in. Mm. They buy a property next time, $2 million. And then they should cover two million term in addition to what I give them. Mm. Uh, so then... 
the term fits the purpose. What I do as, as a father is I buy a safety net. Right. To bless them. Or, correct. Right. Uh, that, you know, they don't need to think about. No, and, they need to do for the health check. And, correct. Right. Yeah. So the purpose is defined differently. Uh, when they have liabilities, then they should take on other things themselves. Right. So like critical illness uh, is something that you want to so-called like, it's sort of like a, a hedge for your time as well as a parent yes. for your kids. Exactly. And of course, life is like a gift for the children. Mm. Right. Um, what about some, somebody at 40? Should they still buy life insurance for themselves? Oh, if they're buying new property, obviously. <laughs> okay, like life or term? Oh, okay. Uh, term is to like, example, cover the, the existing mortgage for yes. their own state property, like for example. Do, should somebody still buy life insurance? There, there's a... There's an endless debate on whether term insurance or life insurance, term plus invest better than life mm. insurance. There's been a Constant ongoing debate. Yeah, debate in the financial products space. Uh, my personal view is that a, a life insurance is a catch-all situation. If we define it as a small amount, we play it say because we don't know. Some people get remarried at 50 plus, 60 plus. They have a new kid then. We really don't know. So, if that purpose is catch all situation, then keep it small. Mm. So to the question, if someone buys a property, $2 million, then that should be defined with a term cover. It's not defined by a life insurance cover. So define it according to the situation also. Right. I think so that's, like that's, real estate is very clear. It's very clear. It's cover your outstanding mortgage in yes. the event or something. So you don't cause the stress to your family. The life is really like, you want to just protect against everything. Yeah. Then you can top out like critical and all that kind of uh, stuff. So that would be a small amount. Mm. Uh, so the mistake usually is that becomes too big. Right. Or new advisors in my industry tend to sell one that does not reflect a good value. Then we may, may have done a bad service to a customer. Right. Because our definition of it is incorrect. Right. In my opinion. So how I'll design it would reflect how I bought it. So I'm, I'm, I'm clean to share. And okay, this is what I bought for myself. You like, you can duplicate this principle catch all situation, then your remaining liabilities, we can define based on number of years. Because mm. term is, we need to define firstly how long. Is it 25 years old? Is it 25 years in duration? Or is it 30 years? Uh, so when there's a need for it, then the duration of it can be defined. Mm. So mortgage until 65, then you cover until 65 or slightly before. Right. It shouldn't be covered in 99. Then again, we've then what's, the, the, what's, the, what's the purpose of that? Yes, we've paid more than required already. Right. Uh, so we've left the mark. We, we should be thinking what is the gap that we are fully uh, trying to aim for. Right. Is, is there like a um, percentage in terms of allocation of like somebody's monthly salary? Like um, how many percent to uh, insurance, stocks, savings, real estate that, I've, I've that you advocate? 10% to insurance way too often already. I, I kind of disagree also. Mm. Uh, or rather, when I look back on my own insurance coverage, it's clearly not, it's a very small percentage. Lower, much lower than 10%. Much lower than 10%. I, I did an audit. Uh, let's put a figure at 500 per month only. Okay. That is a very, very small amount in terms of percentage. So, so I think that 10% mark is, is too, too much. Too much of a uh, rule of thumb that doesn't apply. Okay. How I would like to define insurance coverage is we see like a pyramid. At the start, when you are 25, you don't have much liabilities, you need very little. At the peak of your career, or when you have max liabilities, 35 to 45, everything is, money is increasing, your kids are super young. That's where you need maximum cover. So yeah, that might exceed 10%, for example. But at the start, it doesn't make sense to be 10%. Mm. So again, we go by their need. And this, if you look carefully, it's likely a pyramid, which peaks out at 35 to 45, or maybe under 50. That's your maximum liability. Mm. So you should spend on the cover then and that cover should drop off. And you should taper it off. Oh, you should taper it off, ideally. Because at 50, your mortgage, you have paid some down already. Your liabilities are lower already. Your kids are bigger, closer to independent. Mm. So if that drops off, then naturally your, your amount will drop also. Mm. And you might be uh, at a peak of your income, for 46 to 50. That's why I've discovered through a lot of financial discussions. Right. That's your peak career for most. Right. So at that point of time, maybe yeah, you realize you don't spend that much on insurance. Mm. So the, the, I mean, the, some, some people have that concept in the past that, and I, I guess a lot of people, once they 
purchase insurance, whether is it to support their friends last time or mm. like they just purchase over the years and they forget to sort of like do this tapering process mm. once they are after 45, 50 and all that. And then they continue paying on that. And perhaps they had a idea that, you know, if I pass on that, I will leave a huge sum to my offspring. Do you believe in this concept? And do you think this is a good concept? Like, or do you think that there's not much purpose in the sense that kids should fight it out on their own or stuff like in, that? In Singapore, yeah. most families leave behind a fully paid property already. I think that's the reality. If my parents go, the property is fully paid long ago already. So for most situations, it is it still holds. Mm. What is left behind is already a huge sum from the property sale. Right. So why should you do why more should for you, insurance? Correct. Unless you really deep down believe in it, which is then you have your own beliefs, then that's fine. Mm. But for someone who has who comes with a clean slate of paper, then maybe it doesn't make sense. Mm. So a lot of times in my work, I actually define when you should tail it off. Yeah. So you, you mentioned people brought products all over the place. They have no clue on when to tail it off. Are they overpaying? These are some questions. When should they cash in some? Because they have no understanding of yeah, what is a good time to remove it. So my job is to look at it. Should you consider removing this? Or can we plan this as cash flows for your own retirement? Mm. Uh, so if a, you have three whole life plans, for example, right. could two of them be consumed? One be a catch all situation. Mm. Uh, so consuming them, we, let me define for you why you should consume as well as what is the, at what stage? Is in, and cashing it. And cashing it. Surrendering it yes, to exactly. consume as, as right. done. Because there could be a 90,000 value inside. Right. Uh, and if you cash it out, 90,000 becomes part of your retirement equation. We have yet another asset that comes in. Uh, so for cases whereby we, we need to lay out where the monies are coming from, these become discussions. Mm. So you are somebody that believes that uh, you believe in consuming your policy because this, these are the things that you have saved up in a discipline format over the years. Mm. And it's not like to hold all the way until 100 years old and stuff. Like mm. Right. Um, when it comes to this like planning, where does like property come into the equation? Mm. And like um, at which part of the journey have you started to talk more about real estate content? So for, for someone who has residential loan, mm. to get to retirement, there needs to be a, an understanding when that loan can be paid off. Then they can retire. So the defining how much remaining loan sometimes becomes a core component of their project itself. So if, for example, they have a newly bought condo and they have a 1.5 million outstanding. If they define their retirement at 58 years old, then my job is to show that it was the remaining loan and then what are your asset base that can support paying it off? Because house is house. Right? When we retire in a home, we might be with less mental faculty. Uh, we want something that is fully paid. We don't need stress about it. Mm. So home is different. But then there are some cases where there's home and there's investment property. Then what to pay off first? So my job becomes, okay, you have cash, you can invest, you can pay it off. But paying off investment property is different from paying off home loan. Uh, for one, investment pro property that adds on to your income tax, but then your expenses for interest can be claimed. Mm. Uh, so there's a difference. Yeah. So you approach it, your priorities become different mm. uh, in how you pay off things and simplify the retirement equation. Right. Yeah. So I look at each case and the end result of what is suggested is different mm. for each case. Right. Um, is there is there like a, a case study that you can share in terms of like... Um, like for example, some of the mm. content, like uh, I, I find that you have some very interesting content, like talking about uh, maybe somebody with two or more properties, but they cannot retire. Mm. Or like some people with like uh, maybe a, a property, but they still find it hard to retire and stuff like that. Maybe like, are you able to share like a bit of case that interesting stuff? Like I think two or more properties, they, they can retire <laughs> uh, because there's rental income. I, I think the extreme situation, if there is a inherited big value property mm. that they can't milk out cash flow because it's home, then in that extreme, you are defined as the asset heavy cash type category. But that is a, probably a very niche one. La. So their problem becomes downgrading mm. because quite clearly the property was left behind. Right. Uh, 
So that is an extreme situation. But most cases, uh, if there's more than one property, there's income streams. Then it's to define how does that add on to the entire pie. Mm. So I'm looking at one case very recently. So there is investment property rental income. Right. I add that in, I add CPF life in, and they kind of can get a gauge where are their income streams coming from. And property actually has a very big value because as long as you can get tenant, that rental income will come in. Right? Mm. So there's a lot more belief that that source is stable and historically it's been proven stable. So someone who owns an investment property has that benefit. Then there are discussions, should they sell, should they buy? Then that's where I can help them refresh on latest loss. Mm. Uh, if they sell, what, what's the consequence? Can they rebuy or not? Uh, so then they have to make decisions from there. Uh, so, so, so it seems to me that your advisory is much more holistic. Like, because you also talk a lot about like planning for a TDSR, your mm. LTV for next property, and knowing about the, the, the real estate rules and regulations mm. and stuff like that. And you plan in a very holistic yeah. fashion. And um, how, how about yourself? Like, do you personally believe in like um, real estate allocation mm. as like a huge portfolio? Like in terms of like, example, how, how many properties is a bit too extreme? Like mm. maybe for, for the average family with let's say a combined income of 20,000. Um, do you have like usually frameworks or personal beliefs in, in terms of like allocation and stuff like that? Mm. I, I remember seeing something from DBS in terms of their research mm. that the average household has 41% allocated to real estate. Whether there's accuracy to that, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, but also maybe if that 41% has certain value in average and if someone has a lot more, 80% in real estate, then the question should be asked, are you too optimistic of real estate? Mm. That, that becomes like a, a, a value point that I'll check. I'll reflect that. And then average is like that. Unless you are expert in real estate, then sure, you can be a lot in some an asset class that you are very comfortable in. Mm. Uh, then the other case is there's, there's, of course, families who have bought a property too big that the loan consumes too much because TDSR is actually a very, very tight process already. Or, or I still think it's very loose. Mm. You still yeah, think it's very loose. Okay. Very loose correct. Right. So what I advocate, uh, I've recently done a tutorial, what I advocate is you should spend uh, only a third of your mortgage if you're closer to 55. On your income. Yeah. Right. Even a third, too many cases I've seen your stretch. Mm. 20,000 a third, that means 6,600. Right. I think the thing cannot balance because you have income tax. Yeah. You have kids. You have made. Right. I move the monies out. Very seldom do I see there's a good residual. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, through, through case studies, I realized if one third is to home, then that's a problem. Mm. But again, that's different from investment property because we see that as cash flow. Yeah. So, home, if you commit one third, I think I've seen too many cases it's being stretched. Right. Uh, having said that, I'm not a bear on property also. Mm. I sold my HDB because I will enter the residential market at some point. Mm. So, I used to own, my, my, my first house was a trium HDB flat. Right. I convinced my wife that we'll buy the smallest. Okay. Because that was 2011. 2011, yeah, I got that right. 2011. Right. I thought markets were exuberant by then. You but bought that was a three-room resale. Three-room HDB resale. Resale, okay. 373,000, super small amount. In 2011. 2011. Okay, that was your first matrimonial home. Uh. Correct. Okay. So back then, I convinced her that we buy the smallest possible. Mm. I think the markets are exuberant, but I was wrong. Mm. Because the market speed in 2013. Mm. So it's two years way too early. So it's up, down. Right. And uh, TDS but, are kicking. Oh, correct. Yeah. So that that train only stopped in 2013. Then it started to cool off for the next four years. Yeah. So next four years came down. My home value came down. Uh, then 2016, I kind of saw a lot of on block. That I started to re- And I realized, okay, the, the wave seems real. Mm. Let's start to go and visit low right. offers. So right. my low offer got through in 2017. Right. So I always share the story. My My... Current home is listed 1.33. Mm. I gave an offer of 1.15 mm. only. Right. If I do that in today's market, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that- Not possible. That, that, that SMS will not even be replied. Right. You go home. Right. <laughs> so 2017, you bought your private property. Yes. Right. Then your HGB was sold. I sold only in 2023 completed. Ah, okay. Cost so you bought a new project. 
Uh, no, no. So two nights I bought resale condo. Okay. So resale condo is in my wife's name. We paid TDSR. Uh, we, pay, we pay ABSD. Oh, we pay ABSD. 7%. Okay. Okay. Uh, so okay. ABSD now 20%. Uh, it's, it's a different game. Yes, yes, yes. Your yes, break yes. even years. And you kept your pay. HDB. I kept my HDB. Okay. Uh, on hindsight, uh, not too sure it's a very smart move. Okay. On hindsight. Like, but having said that, uh, neighbors were selling my HDB flat at closer to 300. Okay. Which means I would have seen a capital loss of 73,000. Right. You kept HDB until now? Until last year. And you sold and it? And I exited at 437. Right. So holding on, I let it increase from 300, which is my last transacted, to 437. Mm. So maybe that ABSD is covered already. So you rented it for six years? I rented it for six years. Okay. Correct. So now your name is free already? My name is free. Okay. So game plan is very simple. Mm. My name is free. Why is my name free? Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm also hinting I will fire at when the time is, when I see that, what I've seen in 2016, I, I hope I have that confidence like in, in seeing market demand and uh, whether it's a good time to enter. Right. So I'm banking on that. that you are like monitoring stuff. the market. Yeah. I think sometimes we, we get things right, we get things wrong, but over time we hone our own decision making mm. and uh, we have faith that it's a right move, like right or wrong, we, we have no control. Maybe mm. it's two, three years too early again. Right. Uh, but then the game plan is like that. Like. Okay. Then move move the steps and, and see how it progresses. Okay. Interesting. Do you share like all your personal journey on, on your channel? Yes. Okay. I, uh, I, I hope to inspire some. Mm. Uh, because also when I say I sold my HDB flat, Oh, you, you can bet there's a lot, a lot of comments. Go, why do you, why you sell? You why do you rent a rental? You see your rental is so good. But then they, they didn't realize I've seen my HDB at negative 73,000, mm. 20% down eh, right. for so long. And my decision then was whole. Mm. So now I've gotten top price for it. Right. My, my, my name is freed out because and I you have high, you have higher earning power now as well. Yeah. You can make so, a decision. So I, I realized it's like, you know, playing chess. Mm. If I keep my HDB flat, I'm going to incur ABSD, yeah. 20%. That is crazy, in my opinion. Yes, yes. Uh, through financial products, I can beat 20% negative right. in a heartbeat. Mm. Which means also, I need to bank on government reducing ABSD. Mm. That is also, again, <laughs> yeah. purely speculative. Yeah, And, and time is, is, is something that if we use it on this speculative decision, Correct. we might lose out on time and, and, and it's the largest opportunity cost. Which means if my elders go to secondary school and I decide I need to go nearer to somewhere else, mm. I cannot make the move. Yeah. Because again, HDB, both names are there. I sell my condo, I buy, I still incur ABSD. Right. My moves are stuck on the chessboard. Yeah. So I realized I had to give up the night, which I love. The rent you is fantastic. Yeah. In order to free up to, to win. Yeah. So whether I win or I have no control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The people on the comments are that <laughs> don't, don't see that chess boy, oh, you gave out uh, your so knife. So you I announced last year. Are you so HD? Yeah. Okay. I, I saw it last year. Must be a very interesting episode. And and of course, like our names are so precious. Mm. There's only like two names for you to play around mm. with. Yeah. So you need to maneuver that correctly, which is what is happening to to our clients as well. Like uh and this this technically from 2013 until now. Uh, all the cooling measures, 15 rounds started from 2009 mm. after Lehman Brothers. But 2013 was like one of the largest one because uh, ABSD, LTV, TDS all came in at the same time. Then that brought on a drop period for four years. So it shaped our behavior. Like we started to realize that, hey, our names are so precious. We cannot buy multiple anymore. It seems like the strategy has to change in terms of like the chessboard. It, it perhaps has to shift to something like perhaps each name has to be strategized to buy bigger mm -hmm. rather than, you know, in the past, like our client's portfolio, when I started real estate, it's, it's largely like, maybe somebody will have like a, their own HGB and they will own like four one betas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was like the olden days. Lah. Yeah. But nowadays it's, it has shifted already. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fully. And, and you're right. I mean, like your name by freeing it up, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, How do you like get like a, a holistic, viewpoint through your journey until now and like uh, because maybe like in the financial planning world some financial planners they will be probably like more fixated on maybe just talking about insurance uh what was that motivation to shift to a more holistic level like was there like a pivot event that happened mm. uh why do you want to make that shift to talk about all things together for the whole perspective how i approach YouTube at the start is 
not as a financial advisor actually. Mm. Or rather, I still keep that belief. I When I go into my YouTube space, I'm a YouTuber mm. more than I'm a financial advisor. So financial advisor is there to sell the product, what they have been trained on, the latest new thing. But when I approach from YouTuber's lens, I would realize that the more interesting narration is holistic. Mm. So that really answers why gradually I've shaped the journey towards there. Right. Because if I stuck to my product space, it's not really what customers feel. You don't get that resonating point. Mm. As a YouTuber, I see the content needs to be holistic. Mm. Then the customer understands the story, right. relates that story, wants to listen more. Uh, so gradually, as I go deeper into deeper, that that practice brought, brings results and you no know, results brings uh, competency and belief and it's a, a, a good cycle. Mm. So over time, I've gradually built it right. in this direction and more, more so than ever. Right. So if somebody comes to you like with maybe like a uh, advice, they want, they want mm. to so-called like seek your advice for your services and then maybe they, they just receive an inheritance of like a million dollars. Mm. Uh, what would be your advice for them? Like how should they plan it? Mm. wisely so, and, and let's say this person is 45 years old mm. then just receive one million dollars cash so can you do like a role play cash <laughs> la, so, cash so, la, like, so uh, Melvin okay. you've inherited this amount yeah so my job is to probe a bit deeper mm. okay you've, you've gotten this amount what is your experience in owning assets mm. you've bought before stocks uh, right. a little bit uh, you, you bought property or only have a small flat then I can gauge how, because if you inherited a million dollars and you don't have too much at start, you don't know how to handle it. I have to make the assumption. Mm. Uh, we, we should be ultra conservative on that. Right. On the other hand, if you tell me, oh, I have, I have a business. I'm worth that much. This million dollars, eh, doesn't move the needle. Then again, the entire discussion becomes optimizing. It actually may not be a custom that I pick on also. Because mm. my value to them doesn't stand out already. Right. They'll be pitched left, right, center when they go to a bank. Anyway. So I realized that also. So my, my sweet spot will be somewhere that's not that space, not mm. someone who, who's being pitched all the time that I can help, that I can coach. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I'll ask in terms of starting point. Right. Uh, so then that gives me a good feel what should be recommended. So, uh, so my biggest uh, pitch to you is I would sit in your shoes to think through and decide. So the questions will be leading to what's your history? Right. Uh, how did this come? Because I've actually done cases like that. Mm. So then that's where the suggestions are defined based on if I were in your shoes. Right. So it's like a fully customized yes. process. That is the beauty of it. Which means it's not a $99 product whereby I punch in a calculator, uh, you should allocate 40% to real estate, like what the average of Singapore is. No, it's not the case. Mm. Because again, if you have no experience in that space, does that suggestion, would I, would I do that move or not? Mm. Will you do, even do that yourself? Yes, correct. Right. So when I convey my explanation of what best fit is, hopefully you can feel that I've already taught from your shoes. Mm. Uh, if I'm in your shoes, because my experience level and the customer's experience level is different. Right. So if I see in their shoes, I need to think, does it make sense? The person living that amount, what does the person hope? There are questions that I need to discover also. Right. What if this person is like a single person? Mm -hmm. 45 years old, uh, no, no kids, mm -hmm. single, have a HDB property. Um, what, what would your likely advice be? If that big amount comes in. Mm. Uh, then it feels like that case is to define that the person has enough. Mm. Because knowing that it in itself is tricky already. You haven't looked at your own sums. You haven't thought through how much you really need. My job becomes explaining how much you really need. And after the process, you can't feel, oh, actually I have enough. Then hey, I've gotten this amount that puts me way above why, why I have enough. Then I can explore things that previously I haven't thought through, such as donating it, such as some other thing uh, or retiring right now straight away. Mm. So let's define it again. If I see in your shoes, I can show you, uh, quantify it for you, and then you can make the decision. Mm. Yeah, so if you have nephews, nieces, do you want to create things or not? Then right. it becomes interesting. So it's not really a product that I bring to you. It's, it's if I'm in your shoes, what can we play around with this? Mm. Let's define if we have enough. If we have, it's free play. Right. Right. Or I want to give this to my niece. I want to give, what kind of structures can we build? 
Right. And sure. Yeah. How about um same scenario, but is now a couple, forty five years old. Mm-hmm. Then uh they suddenly have a one million dollar in- inheritance. Uh, and let's say they they had they stay in a condo, mm-hmm. outstanding debt, of in terms of mortgage one million dollars. What would you be your What would you be your advice? Oh, I love our sending that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we definitely need to sit on that our sending that. Okay, let's think through because now if you have gotten this one million dollars through inheritance and you have one million dollar loan, by deciding you are not paying off the loan, you are actually leveraging on that. You are you are actively leveraging on that actually to use this one million for investment purposes. I can show you. I can buy you this fund, this fund, this fund. But actually, when we drew down you are, by not paying off your $1 million home, you're actually taking a leverage on it. Mm. Are we okay with that? Mm. If we are, let, let's define, is it the smartest move or not? Should it be the entire $1 million? If you have invested more than $1 million, sure, $1 million, let's go. But if you only invested $100,000, then we cannot invest $1 million right away. Right? Mm. You need time to accommodate mm. to a big investment portfolio. Right. Because investment portfolios, we see day-to-day mark-to-market value. <laughs> Right. A property, even if the value changes, you don't really do a revaluation. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of financial assets, you see mark to market, your thinking is a bit different. Mm. You're naturally a bit more short term, which means there is an importance for me to coach you to acclimatize. Right. It's like we climb mountain like that. You climb one one thousand meters, no problem. Three thousand meters you need mm, you need training. Five thousand jala already. You need Sometimes you need oxygen to get used to it. You know, you get headaches and stuff. Mm. 8,000 uh, only experienced people go and play that game. Mm. So $1 million pot, if you are right now at a very slow level, I need to pace you correctly. Mm. Which means we need to hide monies. Pay down your loan. Because if you're a private property, you can always do a term equity out. Okay, let, let, let's say let's say they, they, they bought this property or selling that one mil. Mm. But valuation now is 2 million. Like, what would be your advice? And let's say they're okay to hold the, the mortgage. With the same 1 million inherited? Yeah, that 1 million is in the bank now. Mm-hmm. 1 million mortgage, home value is 2 million. Mm. Like, Actually, the home value doesn't really change the equation. Because mm. it's the 1 million in the bank. Yeah. Uh, 1 million in the bank, if you park it to T-bills, for example, you get more than your mortgage rate. Yeah, maybe that, that works. Mm. But again, the idea of paying off the mortgage needs to be clearly discussed. Right. If it's home. Right. Investment property, again, different. Mm. There is no urgency payoff. So if it's home, would you advise to pay it off? I would lead off with that. Right. I don't know. So, mm. so the beauty of each case is I don't know. Mm. Clients who ask, well, what is the template? Actually, that's, that's not the client. It's, it's really about their DNA and comfort level. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. How about you personally? Would you pay it off? Oh, no. For, for me, it's different. Mm. Because I, I know what to do with... I've thought you know what many to do with one million dollars. Yes, right. I, I I've prepared already. So whichever the amount is, the process is the same. Right. Uh, so, uh, that is that is just gunpowder pot on fire. <laughs> okay. uh, so the, the process is the same. <laughs> Very but interesting. I, but I cannot assume that mm. is the same. And you don't you don't want to impose your own beliefs onto your customer. Yes. So right. if I get one million dollars, uh, I should I buy a condo now? No, because I've thought through the process. When I sell the HDB, I am out of the market and I'm waiting for a certain situation. Right. Uh, so that one million is just gunpowder to buy a bigger next one, but it doesn't mean buy now. Right. So the process has been thought through. Mm. So what I like now, I will likely buy more. So you see them quickly flowing there at a pace that I've thought through. Right. Uh, but that that handling of money is, is, is a refinement of, you know, thinking uh, uh, I, I guess you're explaining real estate you already know what you like to purchase mm. uh, so when we think through assets we, we can't get used to it yeah. uh, unfortunately customers we cannot assume that and maybe they are very good in their careers they, they haven't thought through the the asset portion the asset portion what to send the money towards right. and worse still if they are not super savvy with money uh, then uh, I think my best value is to hide that amount better for them until they are more ready Hide as a HID. HID, which means pay off your mortgage, uh, put money to CPF, buy uh, Singapore savings bonds. These are safe assets. Mm. Then you think through. So protect. Protect. And protect. then educate and coach uh, gradually. Correct. So you climb that mountain, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000. 
Then, which means, so sometimes they are, they are a bit shocked. Hey, I, I have this amount. You are, I'm Why aren't surprised you, you are not deploying things? or, no, right. not deploying or. So I also want to protect my reputation long term. Right? If mm. I deploy more, of course, that fits my business. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't work with how I communicate that because that's not what I'll do in your shoes. So your, your consultation basically assesses the risk appetite and also like understanding of the risk appetite part is is not really structured it's more of you know less the questioning part right so the risk appetite is not a, a survey form uh, it's more of you know let's let's discuss mm. then i hear a story that i cannot can guess because i've seen a lot of cases mm. then my intuition uh, can lead me to a different very uh, interesting question. How, how do you remember like so many customers Oh, so now it's a challenge already. <laughs> yeah. So like, like you meet this client, then you meet the other one. How do you remember like their story? Do you like jot it down in your system and stuff like that? So you write a report and uh every, every doctor sees a lot of patients also. Yeah. And what they do is they have case notes. So that case notes gives them a refresher mm. very quickly. Lah. Uh 70% only. The reality is 70%. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember you have this, this, this yeah. complaint. So I try to build case notes also. Okay. Uh, that helps me get a quick refresher. Mm. Uh, then beyond that, now is to build my support team mm. to be more in touch with customer. I think okay. that's the next leg because right. the base is getting big. Right. I need to be better mm. at that because we have finite memory. That's the reality. Mm. But it doesn't mean we would become poorer at that. It just means we have different systems, I guess. Right. Yeah, so I'm here to learn systems from you. Also. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Josh, I uh, can share a little bit about your current company. Okay. Like, uh, are you the founder or are you like with uh, a, a brand? Like maybe just share a little bit with our audience so they, they know like what services you provide as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm with an independent advisory firm. Mm. So same as real estate, we have to take license from a agency, which is what uh, you have now. I have to take one from a principal also. So my principal is Promised Land Independent. So being independent, that's what I went to them for. That's what I want to continue to maintain. Mm. But beyond that, that's how I shape my own practice already. Because it's only a license. Mm. Uh, it's and a platform. It's, correct. Uh, yeah. So they only do the compliance and the, the big picture stuff. So how I shape my practice, uh, that becomes on my own already. Uh, finding the right support staff now is, is where I'm at. Lor, beyond right. beyond right. a one-man show already. Right. How long have you been at Promised Land? I think this is 11 years, is it? Uh, 11 years. Let's, let's, let's. 11 years, right? 11 years. And um, why do you name your YouTube channel Astute Parent? Oh. Yeah. So, you know, just now we're talking about niche. Yes. Like, you know, uh, your new guys, what, what should they need? Their correct, niches. correct. Mm, I pick parenthood to be a niche, uh, not because I have foresight that it's going to be something important because I'm also grasping for what is my niche mm. back then. I was a new parent. So naturally, that gives me a you know affinity mm. to that side. Uh, I I thought that would be a time where people would want more insurance. So I thought, okay, this niche is good because when do you need more discussions is when you have a kid. Everything becomes a lot more at stake. Mm. Uh, so I didn't call the STU parent uh, because I wanted, it's because I wanted to find a niche. Mm. So moving forward, that niche doesn't have that much of a purpose really. Okay. The parent, the, the STU parent, but doesn't have that much of a purpose. Right. Why, why is that so? Because uh, no longer do I talk so much about baby stuff. You used to do that a lot. I, I used to write articles on my own journey as a young parent a lot more. Right. But you don't even see me mention a YouTube channel. You know, I talk about investment, investment, investment products. Right. Um, uh, but the parent, early parenthood part is no longer what my focus is. So I also have these uh, thoughts like, hey, should I rebrand? Mm. But I realize people know me as DSU brand more than Josh Dunn. Right. So I'm like scratching here, like, okay. Is it uh, is it why your intro video has changed to like with Josh Tan? Yes. Okay. I, I'm I'm purposefully thinking how to evolve the brand. Right. Uh, so that's where I'm also discovering and learning. Okay. What is your the name of your second channel? Josh Tan Live. Currently. Okay. So I, I hope to do more interviews mm. like that. Uh, I hope to touch on different market segments that don't want hardcore investment drilling, right. retirement planning. That's quite dry hopefully lighthearted discussions that spark that thought on money. Mm. So that is more experimental. Right. And uh, actually why I started that second channel is actually very practical. Cost insuring, ma, which means if why my main channel gets corrupted, hacked, I lose it. If I rebuild, 
then we are going to start. There's going to be lag time. So, so you want to build concurrently. Correct. So I created a second email, everything from scratch. Uh, it's just to ensure longevity. Like, it's very, okay. very primitive, very- uh, Is that insurance con- also? Correct. So okay. if I have a second one, that means touch wood, anything happen to the first one, I'm not out of the game. Right. I have presence that I can quickly revive. Mm. Uh, um, I read that you started an ice cream business last mm. time and then it, it failed. Um, how has that, when, when was that? Like, which year was that? I think I was age 26. Okay. Was that like your side hustle? Yes. 14 years ago, you know, in, uh, in sales, mm. sales people have peak periods, low periods, and what to do with low periods become a distraction. So back then, 26, I, I was ambitious, but I have no game plan. I think that's a very problematic formula. That is you want to do a lot of things, but then you anyhow chong. So my spare time, I thought, hey, multiple streams of income. Ah. Why not I take my afternoon and go and do uh, a side hustle? Mm. So I didn't want to do ice cream business at start. I want, I just wanted a side hustle, multiple streams of income. You were already doing insurance? Yes, correct. Right. Because I started right off undergrad. Ma. Right. So I was very few years in. There's certain base already. But there's l- low hours, mm. which means I can either- Because appointments are at night, weekends. Correct. Right. So what to do with low hours? Like, can I do business or not? Right. So that, that each comes in. So when I first thought of this, my first approach was Subway, actually. Mm. Can I do a Subway franchise? Mm. Then in that process of getting a franchise, they require me to interview owners. Mm. So I had to go through a process, ask two owners, hey, uh, how much you make? Interview owners as in? Know the process of the store Oh, operations. interview the, the existing Subway mm. franchisee owners. Right. Like homework. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know if you do it now. They did. They required me that in 14 years ago. Okay, assume. and you have to interview at least two. La. Yeah, so okay. just, ask, just ask them. Uh, they know the process. They write a report, what uh, the learning of, points. So in that part, I realized that in good months, they make a few thousand dollars only per store. Profit. Profit. You have expenses, you have franchise fee. Da, 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 Manpower, rental. Goods. Manpower, rental. The boss earns a couple of thousand back then. Mm. On in Lao months, December, when a lot of us are overseas, zero. You can be yeah, break even. And you have to top up. So I was like, huh? I I pour money, I, I own only a few thousand. No la, I'm I'm way better than that. Right. Which is wrong. So right. I went to reconstruct my own license ownership with another small brand, did waffles and ice cream. Then I wanted to earn more margin. So I did more ice cream myself. But it led me to a part where I I export things but I have no expertise in. So it becomes problematic because you make mistakes. Right. Uh, so rather, it's if I had gone with Subway, yes, I make a few thousand. Uh, some months I don't make money. But my capital is, I wouldn't lose it. Right. So and the franchise fee is, is reasonable. It's reasonable. Okay. Yeah. So on hindsight- Oh, but the ice cream is like a brand new brand. Yes. Your which, own brand. Which means I have that pride, but I lose money. Mm. And there's no system, no winning formula. No winning formula. That is problematic. Because my product is sloppy my end product. Mm. My ice cream, because I'm not in the F&B space, I haven't thought through how does a customer consume it. So very interesting. My ice cream, I, I do is ice cream cake. So you can, I cut it out. You can take this ice cream cup, very nice. And A, you can eat it now, solid. It tastes good. I I, I think it's not bad. Huh? Okay. But the problem is you're, you're so happy about it, you want to bring it home. Right. To show your wife. And it melts. It every, melts. Crazy. Everything right? becomes slumpy. Then you blame me. Right. But I didn't realize from a product creator that is that is crazy. You shouldn't you shouldn't allow a customer to bring, bring the end home. product home, and it, when it melts, they blame you. You shouldn't hint them on the possibility that you can bring it home. Correct. And my packaging is for you to take away home. I so see. I started to solve that problem by putting dry ice for you to bring home. But that again escalates the cost. So all sorts of fundamental mistakes right. that you make in any business. And so how long did that business last? Oh, I bled for. 10 months, 11 months, and I ran out of capital. You sing in your- I sing in all my savings. Right. I, I didn't take on debt, which means no problem. You just burn all your money. But there was a realization that it's either I continue to burn my wife's money or I take the shame and close shop. Right. And you're using all your so-called like earnings that you have saved yes. from an insurance business. Correct. Uh, I did sales, which means day one, you can make money. Uh, I'm not spent I, I don't wear anything glamorous now. You right. know, it's like it's something I resonate with you. So it's not, not nothing flashy. Right. Uh, which means I can save money. 
but that capital is finite. Mm. You keep losing, losing 10,000, there's finite amount only. Mm. I spend so much on renovation, which is silly. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, I have to confront the reality. Can I continue to be a prideful boss or I cut the loss and save my wife's money? Because obviously I can dig her money. They will get us in a bigger hole and we might not recover. Mm. Uh, so that, that was a... What was the... At age 26, you just got married. I was no. going to get married. Okay. Yeah. So like, what was your aspiration back then as a young person? I had all sorts of fancy business plans for the ice cream shop. So beyond sales, I always imagine I would try to build something. Mm. So when I did my willful business planning thing for my ice cream, I projected way, op- way too optimistic. Right. Like because a I lot imagine, of stores. Correct. And, oh, okay. I imagine I can build so far. Right. Little did I wonder I would stumble at my first step. Mm. And and the good part also is because I was doing my advisory work and the ice cream business. When I left advisory work, just like in sales, maybe it's a story you can share with your, your guys who are new also. You're always thinking, hey, sales business, I need to chase customer. Right? Mm. Sucks. Right? I don't like to go and meet people, face rejection. Sales is not fun. If I have a door that opens, people walk in, the glory is on me. It's, mm. it's so nice. Mm. Uh, I did not appreciate my service business. But when I had a physical business, the ice cream business, I, I realized my service business is beautiful. I have no overheads. I sleep the whole day. I, I don't get negative from rental. Mm. I, I shouldn't sleep the whole day. The first There's day, no uh, running fixed costs. There's no running fixed costs. And all, all it requires me is just to find customers. Actually, with a physical store, I also had to find customers. Mm. Because at the start, no one comes through a door. Yeah, there's no brand yet. My imagination that with my brand, people would queue up. Was in, that at a shopping mall? Uh, I did SMRT. Okay. Lo- the footfall is not too bad. Okay. But when I think of uh, Swenson, Swenson people queue up. Right. But I'm not Swenson's. I, oh. I, I clearly overestimated what Swenson's has done to get there. Mm. I'm just a nobody ice cream cake that wants to look like them. Mm. So nobody queue up for my thing. So I still had to go and find customers, or do all sorts of leaflet promotions, very primitive. Right. Uh, then that's where I rest quick. When I close that, actually my service business is beautiful. I regret not treasuring it. And all it needs is for me to figure out that marketing. Mm. Get my act together and figure out marketing. I can I can do it better. Why did I use my spare time to go and play with something else than to master my marketing? Mm. So that is a realization, a first, a first step to reshaping. Right. Uh, and that was in 2011. Yeah, I would think so around there. 2011. Around there. And then after that, through that, that that whole journey was like one year or two years? One year plus. One year plus. One year plus. So it lasted until 2013 and then 2015 you found an astute parent. Yes. Right. Yes. I also like share a very similar story is that uh, through my last 17 years, I've, I've seen like some realtors that uh, has a lot of potential to do very well. But once they have sort of like um, close couple of like big deals, uh, the, f- the first instinct is they want to change their car. They want to change their watch. Uh, they fail to invest in real estate, even though they are doing real estate. That's number one. Number two trend that I saw is that they start to want to explore other kind of businesses. Not saying that it's no good, but I think I, I recognize with the fact that if let's say at a very on start, if you can specialize on a deeper level, you build your expertise, be known for that, after that, once you have surpluses, you can always try other things. But I think they they didn't dig deep enough and then they went to try a lot of things. And and that journey actually took them a lot of years. And and when they want to come back to real estate, it's a little bit too late because the market has shifted. Product knowledge has all changed and all that. So so I've seen quite a fair bit of this kind of trending, uh, which I, I, I think like you 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 took like, even though like you took that hit, but you recover very quickly and then you, you, you try to reposition yourself, which, which is great. What does money mean to you? Like um, from a young age, like from childhood until now, what does money mean to you in terms of meaning? A lot of times on the channel, I also try to discuss mm. such things. Because so money means something different, you know, for, for everybody at different stage. So money, when I don't have it, when I bled everything to the ice cream business, become survivor already. So I think the important part is we, everybody listening in is at a different phase. If you're at a starting phase, then yes, you just find income, find money, survival to help you think longer term. 
Then once you get to a longer term, then it probably becomes impact. What can you use money to deliver? What can you teach your own family members and to teach and impact society? Mm. But the steps need to be right, right? I guess you also agree. At the start, once, once you get survivor, you think longer term. Then longer term, then you think super long term. Yeah, so maybe at this stage now, I, I can afford thinking a bit longer term. Mm. So right now I'm thinking, yeah, how, what is impact that I can deliver right. with the money already? Um, do you have a positive viewpoint of money or a negative viewpoint of money when you were a child? Hmm. Like for me, like um, back when I was a child, because the conversation at my home, I have, I have fantastic parents. So they work very hard to make sure that all their three kids can go to university. Average family. My dad is a taxi, was a taxi driver. He's still driving now. So like for a taxi driver to send three kids to uni is, is tough, right? But of course, the conversation at home is usually a little bit more anxious. It's like uh -huh. money is not enough and all that. So, so sort of like when I grew up, I realized I had a fear mm. of, of like always worrying that money is not enough. Like what was your conversation when you were a child? So for your, for your case, that drove you to, that was your motivation to do mm. very well. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, I think a lot of times I also mentioned to my wife also, we can't simulate hunger. You know, it's like, we can compete, but we just, wow, people in third world country, super hungry on, wow, they, their drive is also different. Yeah. You, and we can never understand the, the yes, pain that they have. Correct. Yeah. The drive, the, although the money part, scarcity, but their, their drive part is super. Mm. We may not be able to compete with them. Right. So I, I was fortunate, money was never a scarcity thing too much. Uh, but I also had to go through some things. My, my own father had stroke which means at my undergrad years, or rather why I started into the insurance industry, mm. is because I my dad has stroke, which means he could no longer be the head of household. And I had to think for myself, hey, it's time to grow up. That, at least that was the first thought that came to my mind. How old were you back then? <clears throat> 21, 22? Mm. 21, 22? Mm. Probably 22. Uni yeah, so days. 18 years, yes, uni days. So that preceded my start of my career. In that was advisory. like a probably a decision a making prompt to start finding jobs. Right, right, right. Uh, start because previously I'm I'm okay. I'm I'm just playing sports. I uh, go out with my girlfriend, with my wife now. Enjoy your uni days. Correct. I don't want to work. Uh, so the mindset is different. Oh, okay. Uh, so so that probably was a trigger event. Trigger event to start to work. To think. To to okay. Start to be responsible. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> if you ask me, twenty years ago, I probably would be not so responsible because the circumstance didn't require me to do so. Mm. So time to be more responsible means I, okay, start finding part-time work. Can I fund my own university? Then find part-time means hey, but the highest earning method, sales. You don't need qualifications. You can start straight away. It's all driven by you. That's how I gravitated there. Uh, then how to sustain it then becomes the next game. Mm. But then again, you know, that's, that's why I started also. Right. If not, I wouldn't have worked as an undergrad, but I'll be happy playing sports and, and you know, uh, doing things different. Mm, mm. So what's the, the next step for your business? Mm. I, I, I've been narrating this quite a bit, which means I, I envy what Gordon Ramsay has been bu building. Mm. You know, he's, he loves his food, uh, which I see is my craft in advisory work and finance. But he has books, he has shows. He's a... Uh, he has a brand. Mm. Uh, uh, I hope to build something like that more than just my advisory work. Right. Which means the, the shows, the books start to come in. Right. Like an uh, ecosystem like in terms ecosystem. of your brand. You have your agency, you have your 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 media site. Mm. So it's amazing to, to see. You know, you are quite some distance uh, ahead of me. That's right. that's why. Yeah. That's why I, I also learned that you know it can be done. Uh. Yeah, I mean we're we're on a different journey, different sort of like specialization as well. Mm. And uh I think it's also about enjoying the journey. Yes. Yeah. When we're on this, like um when you started as two parents is really with a positioning in parenting, then now you're on a holistic level, which is great. Yeah. Um how about like for family wise? Like mm. what what advice do you have for parents with like two, three kids? And then like schooling years, how should maybe the planning be different a little bit? Or is there any usual the advice that is like evergreen one that you give to parents? Wow. Uh, cases that I pick up now, mm. 
typically the parents income are a bit better already then it will be a good fit so there's problems that i will be solving for them such as the mortgage and stuff something that we've discussed so mm, far 40 plus 40 yeah, correct late 30 so mortgage how to pay it off uh, what are their commitments now let's start to start to prepare for next leg right uh but having said that i i try to give free case studies on my channel where i meet you know a different uh income level zone then discuss from their point of view and hopefully share some pointers mm. uh, there are always evergreen things which means you need to prepare to be self-sufficient you don't want service generation to the next next kids and stuff which means yeah if you don't pay off your mortgage your retirement can be set in you would depend on your children mm. or you need to face the downgrade mm. so i think these are evergreen things right uh, to to shape for each family but it then depends on you know where they are at starting point customized situation mm. right maybe we, we talk a little bit about the last topic yeah. like do you do tax planning yes it's part of the equation mm. so uh, i've i've gone on radio channels to speak on tax solutions and it's something that i cover also a lot on the channel right uh and there are mistakes actually on on that front so parents maybe i can share uh if you have a few kids or two kids very common what parents do is all oh, one kid to you one kid to me but little do they realize there's caps in terms of relief. Mm. Uh, so if a wife is high income earner, the working mother's child relief will have maxed out their relief already, which means you park children relief under that side. It's a waste of money. You mm. might as well park both under daddy's name. Mm. Uh, so these are things that when I, when I see, I, I can quickly point out to be more efficient. And things I also you know openly suggest to take note of. Right. So tax relief part, yeah, there are a lot of mistakes uh, that I can see. Uh, beyond that, how to optimize? What well, should you contribute to SRS account, special account? Uh, these are things that, depending on situation, should be brought into the picture. Mm, right. And then, um, so basically portfolio planning, tax planning, insurance. And of course, the last part is that you talk a lot about stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, um, why did you start to specialize in like talking about specific stocks, performance of REITs and all that? Like, what was that? that push to go into that? Was that because there was a lot of demand for, mm. from your listeners and all that? You know, uh, just like I mentioned, when I go into YouTube space, <clears throat> I approach it as a YouTuber, mm. which means what is trending, I need to pay attention also. Right. And respect that trend. Mm. That's how you succeed on, on the algorithm. Right. So in terms of stocks wise, I realized, hey, these are topics that I can brand very quickly. Mm. Rather than talk about something that's obscure, mm. then I need to find a way to craft it or don't even touch it. Because right. there is no relevance mm. in the YouTube space from a YouTuber's perspective. Right. So it's not just what I like, but also fusing what I like with what is market demand. So REITs happen to be good in market demand now and something that I like, which I think is undervalued. Mm. So that topic is easy for me to snowball. Mm. Would it be, oh, actually thinking back before COVID 2019, I actually said don't buy REITs. Mm. So I actually went to a REIT symposium uh, I did mention that I'm not like evergreen on REITs or so. No, no, no. Because that- So actually advise people not to buy. Yeah, I said, uh, you should look elsewhere. Uh, actually back then, 2019, there were so many causes teaching on REIT investing. It was the shining light. You put money there, real estate, you don't manage even. And the yield is pretty good. Mm. So 2009, a lot of causes were there and REITs skyrocketed. Mm. I actually felt that it was, mm, you know, we should diversify. Right. Today, me, I'm saying REITs are super cheap. Ignore the fact that it's depressed, its performance is terrible for the last two years. So that is where I park my money in and that's where I describe. So if real estate comes down residential, I might change the tune. Mm. Uh, so uh, we'll see what, what, what comes on. I'm right. also excited. So basically you're, you're, you're just bringing your, your audiences through your own journey. Yes. <clears throat> which, which I think is awesome. That's the most authentic one, I think, in a lot of ways. Right. Awesome. Great. Um, I think it's time for us to, to yeah. <laughs> have you select um, some cards, usually we do three. Yep, so you can take your pick. And then of course, uh, read out the question. Dun dun. Okay. Oh, I, do, I have to read out a question. Yes. <clears throat> what is one professional skill you are currently working on? Wow. How are these crafted by? The uh, this, so, so 100 teammates, one person contribute one question. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Actually, 2013, if I look back, every year I try to do one breakthrough however small it is. Mm. I realized 2013 was when I realized I shouldn't be a solo printer anymore. I should learn to create better team structures. 
So with regards to professional skill, I think it's about bringing and motivating right team members, uh, building the right systems around my workflow. Mm. So I'm about six months, nine months into doing that. Right. And it's something I'm still very uh, starting phase at. So I also go through YouTube to learn how to motivate people, hire people, and uh, incentivize people the right way. Right. So that's the professional skill I, I hope to build. Okay. So more on like um, talent management, yes. performance mm -hmm. management, and also like building a, a structure, yes. uh, a, a good team system. Yes. Right. Awesome. Great. Um, second question. Purple one. What title would you give this chapter in your life? Huh. I, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'm starting to feel the pressure of primary school already. Primary school, okay. <laughs> yes. So right now- Your um, kids are nine and- Nine and three. Nine okay. and four. Nine and four. Right. So nine means primary three. Yeah. Primary three, you get a first taste of school exam. Mm. So now there's even more pressure for me to, to guide my elder boy to focus. Right. So that is always weighing on my mind. If, if this is a chapter, it's about being the right motivator for him to do well in school. Mm. Uh, I have no clue how to do that. If you have any idea, leave the comment section <laughs> how, to, how to get kids to be motivated. Okay. Because I, I, I'm also struggling to really fine tune that, that message to him. To right. Excel. Right. Are you like, um, uh, in terms of like parenting, are you all like very hands-on on their oh, school work? I, or? I'm hands-on from day one. Uh. So uh, the story is most people would have a lot of support like nanny, confinement nanny and stuff. I was, I was many, I was confinement nanny. So I didn't hire anyone. Uh, my mom-in-law came in to help. But beyond that, I was with my wife. Mm. So I, I like the idea of hands-on. Mm. Uh, that's strength and weakness, uh, which means that that's why I'm a solo printer until 2023. Because mm. two hands-on means you, you, you want things your way and you believe it's the best. Mm. Uh, so that is, uh, that's why I ship handling my kids that way and my business that way. Mm. All right. Great. Come, final question. What is your perspective on work-life balance? Why I love this? Because I have to do this better. <laughs> in, in, interesting stories. I film everything at home. So I was chatting with the guys like, uh, I, I wish I have a better setting. Uh, when filming from home, the good part is I can get things set up very quickly. No traveling time, nothing. But the bad part also, there's no di dissection of work. Mm. I step in the living room, I get into work mode. You we, film at your balcony, right? I film at my, I cut out like, my living room is super big. Mm. So I cut out enough space to film. Right. And I put my computer there, it's my dungeon uh, right. to get into work mode. Mm. So in that dungeon, I realized that uh, it's very hard to have work-life balance. So how I try to overcome is I take quick trips, Malaysia, day trips, short trips. That becomes my only way to dissociate. Mm. Uh, because at home, I, I wouldn't be sitting on the sofa. I don't have TV. Rather, I advocate for no TV anyway. So I'll naturally go back to the dun dungeon to get started on something because there's always that dream to, hey, can I do a bit more. Mm, mm, uh, mm. So in that way, the work-life balance gets blurred already. Right. Uh, so the the so how to handle it, I think we all need our own methods. So far, what has worked best is your leave home. That's the best. How how does that affect like your parenting, like mm. with your kids? Well, let's talk about the stressful part, lah, maybe. Mm. So when when my boys are arguing, not obeying, obviously there's pressure. Because in my little workspace, I can still hear. Mm. the struggles. So- It's like just one sliding door, right? Correct. Okay. Which cannot soundproof anything. If I'm in office, then sure, my wife has to fight the fire herself. I don't care. But no, I, I'm in that little space and I can hear the struggles. So it becomes on me how to, how to manage it. Mm. If I go and fight fire, I realize my, my work is not done. Mm. So that pressure is, is a bit hard to describe. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, it's something the, that you're working on. Yes. The good part and bad part comes together. The good part is you have super efficiency. And you save time. Yes. Yeah. Going, come out, going, come out. After I'm done with my thing, I quick, quick come out, wash plates if I need. Uh, but also when two worlds call for your attention, some things are not going to be done very well. Mm. And to live with that, you know, regret needs to be on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Right. 
Thanks, thanks okay, for sharing. Okay, I've that well. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thanks for sharing like um, so authentically. And I mean like we, I, I always believe like we all have our own struggles, mm. challenges. What life balance has, has always not been easy. I mean like no matter what kind of framework that you adopt. uh, How, how do you teach your people if you are asked that question? Yeah, yeah. Throw the question back. In fact, we, we, we did a lot of like uh, sort of like training sessions on this topic before. So we follow this model by James, uh, no, not by James Clear, by uh, Jay Papasan on the one thing, which is um the three models. Lah, basically, like um in terms of like the first model is that we feel that work and life has to be separated. Second model is that you don't manage your life well and you put work as your ultimate focus. And they realized that actually there was a research done that work-life balance, this keyword actually popped up only perhaps in the 1980s. Yeah, before that, there wasn't really work-life balance because like in the previous era, most people have work and life at the same place. For example, in the farming days, mm. uh, the home and work is all in the same place, ma, right? You go out and come in, it's all in the same place. So a little bit like, like what you're doing mm. now, right? Then your kids help out in the farm and all that kind of stuff. So I think... Uh, we follow that model in the sense that because we have so many aspects of our life, personal, finance, our health, spiritual life, uh, relationships with family, re relationships with friends, personal growth. And uh, if we don't have like touch points on a weekly basis, if we don't time block like a date night with our wife, mm. uh, uh, once a month with our kids alone, meet our friends like once a month, uh, work out on a weekly basis. So if we don't touch that on a weekly basis, we don't time block, then we don't have the focus for work. And work should be like uh, on a very project basis. Like when we want to make things happen, especially big things, we should whack and then we mm. should like focus it. So for example, let's say if we want to make an event happen, naturally we will work over time. Mm. We will want to put out all our focus for the next two weeks to make it happen. And then, but once our equilibrium in the middle is always touch, like for example, if I always have a date night with my wife every Monday night, then our family can have the expectation and they will know where we are and they will know like, okay, this is the time for us to be together. We, we talk about things every week. There will not be deviations too much. So then, then we'll start to feel like, hey, there's a nice balance but we can still Chong for our work. Yeah. We we just had a sharing two days back. One of our leaders was sharing about this book called Hyper Focus. And uh, true enough, like the book says that most of your great ideas for your content, for your business, for your work comes when you are in shower, when you're in the bathroom, right? And like, what if like 10 p.m. you have an idea for your content, you have to faster write it down and stuff. And you can't say that, hey, now it's 10 p.m. I'm at home. I can't do anything, right? So I think we use that approach. Lah. But of course, but it's not 100% easy, but we, we use that approach. I, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, my takeaway is that if you have the right touch points, maybe the sacrifice doesn't feel that much, maybe. Mm. At least that's, that's what I'm imagining. Yeah, yeah. And also like your, your loved mm. ones will know that you're there on a consistent basis. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thanks, 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 thanks for uh, being authentic to share about your journey, uh, especially like your field business, your initial years, mm. also like your journey into this space, which I think is is wonderful because uh, I think you're one of the people in the finance space that talks a lot about case studies. Yeah, mm. and I, I think case studies really benefit audiences a, a great deal. Thanks for talking about the three questions as well. And, and we're, we're glad that you're on NOTG. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank yes. you, Josh. Happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. Uh, usually it's about one and a half hours. Okay. Sometimes uh, we might stretch a little bit. I was saying, uh, guys, usually I do uh, my videos only 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're trying to mimic to uh, Joe Rogan. Go for three hours. Yeah, <laughs> crazy like that. 